Starting this video where not many people live or even visit, I'm in the small city of Bristol in the Florida Panhandle. It has a population of just over 900 people. It's also the only incorporated city in Liberty County. Liberty County is the least populated county in Florida and is also one of two counties that don't sell alcohol at all. This is pretty much the extent of Bristol. I was looking for some distinctive government buildings or a downtown area and didn't really find anything. But this is now the 63rd county of Florida that I visited. So now I'm heading west to the 64th county I'm about to visit in Florida. But to get there, I'm going to cross the Apalachicola River. I think the bridge I'm on is pretty old, and you can see the more modern bridge on the left that carries vehicles in, in the other direction. Also, I'm not sure if you can see, the, this bridge used to carry one lane in, in each direction, which looks like a pretty tight squeeze. This is called the Trammell Bridge. It was built in 1938 and was rehabilitated in 1998. Wow, this bridge is really long too. Hey guys, it's Emily. Welcome everyone. I'm taking a trip through what is called Florida's Forgotten Coast, where I'll travel through some of the most remote areas in Florida. And by the end of the day, I will have visited all 67 counties in the state of Florida. So let's see old Florida together. Let's go. Let's see a map of where I'm going today. Here's a map of the state of Florida. So I'm going to zoom in on the panhandle where it runs along the Gulf of Mexico. I started in Bristol and I'm heading to Blountstown in Calhoun County. Then I head south to Weewahitchka in Gulf County. Then reaching the, the coast at Port St. Joe. Then I head east toward Apalachicola in Franklin County. I continue east to Carabell, then head back north to Stop Choppy. When I reach County 67, Wakulla County, I'll end the day in Crawfordville, that county seat. I finally crossed that long bridge and have reached the city of Blountstown, the county seat of County Number 64, Calhoun County. Not far from the downtown square is this painted mural. You've seen this many, many times on this channel where towns have painted a painted mural with images in each of the letters. In this case, the letters su suggest the city has lots of farming and agriculture. A block away is the m and Railroad Memorial Park, and there's a short train in the grassy area. The railroad was very important to Blundstown's economy in the early 20th century. The M and B stands for Mariana in Blundstown. It may have been the shortest railroad at just 29 miles, but it was critical to transport agricultural products, manufactured items, and even U.S. mail between those two cities. This, I believe, was once the actual railroad line where this train sits, and the train is the first train along this route that used a diesel engine back in 1947. The railroad has been converted into the Blantstown Greenway, a walking and biking path. The railroad also operated passenger service until the automobile became more common. The train line with was in service from 1909 to 1972. This park opened in 1994 as a memorial of sorts for, for what was a vital railroad laying through Blountstown. Now I've reached the town of Weewahitchka. The population of the city is about 2,100 people. 
The city is known for having one of the largest beekeeping operations in the country and is a large producer of what is called Tupelo honey. Tupelo honey is considered the most valuable type of honey because it doesn't crystallize. This area of Florida produces the purest Tupelo honey. Wewahitchka was formerly the county seat of Gulf County, and this was the old county courthouse. Oh, and since I reached Gulf County, this is county number 65. There's two more counties left to go. This marker says this county was formed in 1925, and the first county business was done in the local business house until this courthouse was built in 1927. Wewahitchka was the county seat until the seat was moved to Port St. Joe in 1965. This other marker mentions the settlement of Fort Place was the precursor to Wewahitchka. Wewahitchka is a Native American name for water eyes, which makes sense how swampy this area is. On the other side, it mentions some of the early settlers and how Wewahitchka became famous for its great hunting and fishing in the nearby dead lakes, streams, and forests. But why did they move the county seat to Port St. Joe? This courthouse, however, is still in service and still serves various governmental functions for people living in this area, basically saving them a trip to, to Port St. Joe about half an, half an hour south of here. This area was also featured in the 1997 film Yuli's Gold, starring Peter Fonda, a story about the beekeepers that harvest Tupelo honey. Now I've reached the cur current county seat of, of Gulf County, Port St. Joe. This is a beautiful and, and very quiet area of coastal Florida, very quiet compared to nearby Panama City Beach. This is the Cape San Blas Lighthouse. I bet there are some great views of, of the city and, and the Gulf of Mexico from the top. There's a staircase that leads inside, then a spiral staircase inside that leads to the top. There is an admission price though, plus it's cloudy, so I won't be going to the top of the lighthouse. The stone walkway leads to the shopping district that way. Port St. Joe was formed as St. Joseph in 1835, but was abandoned due to a yellow fever outbreak in 1841. The town was resettled in 1909 after the railroad arrived. The town was then renamed Port St. Joe. Today, Port St. Joe has a declining population of about 3,400 people. Let's go across the street and check out the historic downtown area that looks like where many of the shops and restaurants are located. According to the city's Chamber of Commerce website, Port St. Joe is described as a small beach town with a with a big heart and where visitors feel like locals. It also mentioned that the city was badly damaged by Hurricane Michael in 2018 and is still being rebuilt. Also, every summer they have the Forgotten Sea Turtle Festival. Remember I mentioned the railroad arrival spread the rebirth of Port St. Joe. Here's one of the trains used along that railroad route, operated by the St. Joe Lumber and Export Company. This train and numerous other historical locations are not far from where I am. As far as the railroad, this marker says the railroad opened in 1910 and was the first steam railroad in the state of Florida. Like the other train I saw earlier, you cannot climb onto the train, plus it's surrounded by an iron fence. Some other events that are held in Port St. Joe, Blast on the Bay, Florida Scallop and Music Festival, Ghost on the Coast? Are there ghosts in this town? Is this place haunted? Let's check out another location across the street 
where some important Florida history took place. This is the Constitution Convention State Museum. This is a museum that details the creation of the state of Florida when its first state constitution was ratified. And it also plays in this park where a museum is now located. If I have more time, I might check out this museum, but I still have a lot of ground to cover. So this museum has many artifacts from when the state of Florida was created. I was wondering why Tallahassee is the state capital instead of something closer to the center of the state. Now it makes a little more sense. Port St. Joe is about an hour or so from Tallahassee, and I think in the, the 1830s the Florida Peninsula stretched all the way to Louisiana. I'm not sure about that though. Check out what's in front of me. In this park is this giant and elaborate granite marker signifying the birth of Florida, which took place right here in 1838. This memorial is to commemorate the birth of the state of Florida and the assembling of the first constitutional convention of the state. There was a building at this point where the convention took place in 1838. I bet this museum would tell me what happened to that building. Florida didn't officially become a state until 1845, but the Constitutional Convention paved the way for Florida to become the nation's 27th state. Okay, moving on to the next city. I'm now in Apalachicola, another small town along the Forgotten Coast, with a population of just 2,300 people. Over here is the Rainy House Museum, built in 1838, and is on the National Register of Historic Places. This, the museum has decorations and furnishings from the 19th century. This museum is under renovation. I have to think the humidity and the occasional hurricane have really taken its toll on this edifice. This marker mentions this area was a critical port for cotton. David G. Rainey built, built this house near the port, and his son George served in the Confederate Army, but later served in the Florida Legislature, Florida Attorney General, and Justice in the Florida Supreme Court. Across the street from the Rainey house is this antique store. Looks like they have a wide variety of stuff. They have the, an empty phone booth over here by the open sign. To the side of the building is this bicycle tree. It's a tree with a bunch of bicycles in it. That's kind of weird. This is probably because the business has a bicycle repair shop. Yeah, there's bikes in the tree and all around the tree. Look at the fence over there. Along the top are a bunch of bicycle tires. The owner of this business is artist Kevin Hand. Yep, he, fix he fixes bicycles and uses them in his artwork. There used to be a bicycle rim dome structure that was taken down a few years ago. I'm now looking at the Franklin County Courthouse. Apalachicola is, is the county seat, and this makes, makes county number 66. There's one more county to go until I've reached all 67 counties in Florida. This monument says, Mark's wanted is to remember Lieutenant Willoughby Ryan Marks, who sacrificed himself in, in the Ar Argonne battle during World War I. The marker was probably installed here in 1934, as there is a pin down here dated 1934. The marker predates the courthouse that it faces that was built in 1940. Behind the courthouse is this pretty rough looking jail. The window openings are replaced with thick concrete blocks. You better not commit any crimes in this city. Now heading out of Apalachicola to our next destination, 
But first, I have, a tra- I have to travel across the- this very top bridge over the Apalachicola River. Speaking of this river, Apalachicola has a large oyster industry. For decades, Florida, Alabama, and Georgia have been going to court over how much water they can use. The headwaters originate in Georgia and eventually flow down here and on to the Gulf of Mexico. Florida's concern is the oyster industry will suffer if they don't get enough fresh water from upstream, but Georgia argues they need water for their cities. This will probably go to the Supreme Court to resolve. Here's the road we just traveled. You can see the Apalachicola River way in the distance. My next roadside attraction is at this furniture store. I'm at this furniture store because it has this very large log in front of it. Here's a marker for this log, which is called Big Charles. The cypress log measures 24 feet in length and weighs 15,000 pounds. It's also thousands of years old and discovered in the Apalachicola River a few years ago when it was taken out of the water. The owner of this furniture store purchased the giant log and placed it here so it would never be cut and will remain an important part of history in this area. Isn't it ironic a store that sells wood furniture made from cut wood has a big log that they don't want to cut. It's hard to tell how old it is based on the rings. All the rings look really close together. The marker also said the log was partially submerged in 30 feet of mud underneath the river floor and dredging finally allowed someone to remove the log completely from the river. So that's Big Charles, the ancient cypress log. Let's head along the coast to see what else I can find. I'm not far from the city of Carabella, and just a little bit inland from the Gulf of Mexico is the Crooked River Lighthouse. It looks very similar to the lighthouse in Port St. Joe, except for the red color on the top half of the lighthouse. This lighthouse was built in 1895 and restored in 2007. It's it's 103 feet tall, which is the tallest along the Forgotten Coast. There are 128 steps inside that will lead you to the top of the lighthouse. I bet at 103 feet you'll get a fantastic view of the gulf. Didn't I just say that when I was at the lighthouse in Port St. Joe? I'm going to repeat that it costs $5 to reach the top, and since it's so cloudy, it just doesn't seem worth it. Apparently no one else is climbing to the top either, as you can see. To the right the lighthouse is the Keeper's House Museum, which has many antiques from the early 1900s. As for me, I have to continue heading eastward. Not far from that lighthouse it is this rest area. So I got the color scheme at the picnic benches. This rest area looks like it hasn't changed since the 50s. This is Carabelle Beach Park. This is probably my only chance to go to the beach and enjoy that great white sand found on the Gulf Coast. So I'm going to take a quick peek at the water. Not many people swimming in the Gulf today. At the time of filming, the temperatures are in the mid-50s and it's been cloudy all day, and it's a little windy here as well. I think the only creatures enjoying the water are these seagulls. Not much in the way of waves here, but it's so cold. I think the damp Florida cold hits a little differently than the dry cold in Georgia at the same temperature. What do you think? Please leave me a comment. 
There are a few people out here, some wearing jackets, but another person way down there is with shorts on. I think we found an oyster shell over there. Over, didn't work. Well, I've got my fellow the windy, cold beach, so I'm gonna continue eastward along the forgotten coast. It sure isn't busy around here. This is clever. The women's restroom is for gulls, and the men's restroom is for buoys. This is interesting. On the marker estates, Carabao Beach was used to train for the Normandy invasion on D-Day in World War II. The troops had trained for three years, and it was the final training site before the shipping out to England for the invasion. That's awesome. I never knew that. On to my next stop. Now I'm in the small town of Carabao. This building is our Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center. Look, Santa's here. Across the street from that Visitor Center is what looks like a phone booth, but this booth is actually the police station. How could a phone booth be a police station? Yep, this is the world's smallest police station. I guess there isn't a lot of crime in Carabao, with a population of just 1,200 people, so a phone booth is all you need. There's some information inside the phone booth. In 1947, Alvin West Westberg became the police chief and the only day policeman in Carabao. He was responsible for protecting the citizens, pump water for the tugboats at the dock, catch speeders, and handle prisoners at City Hall. When someone needed assistance from the police, a policeman would receive calls from the, from the phone that was actually inside the booth. There was no actual police station, so for decades the phone booth was the only place where a policeman would receive a call. The only problem is when a policeman was not near the phone, People would use the phone to make long distance telephone calls for free. This police station was featured on many TV shows, including The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. So let's check out Carabelle's downtown. This downtown area was formerly part of a mill that processed cypress timber, turpentine, and naval stores. Ferry service started in the early 1920s to transport those products to Tallahassee. Not too much in the downtown area, there's a sandwich shop and a hardware store. Some of the windows are still boarded up, I'm not sure if they boarded up when Hurricane Ian was originally expected to make landfall here. There's a few blocks away is the Carabao Bottle House. On this property, they have structures that are made from glass bottles. There's a gate that, and it's said it's open, but I'm just going to take a look from the outside of their property. Look at the lighthouse they made. And they used many different colors of glass bottles. This was created by former art professor Leon Weisner. There's another building over there. The glass bottles and concrete form the exterior walls. Looks like they found some square bottles which appear to be arranged in the shape of a rainbow or, or an arch. That night, the lighthouse and bottle house are lit up. I bet that looks really neat. The bottle house was created in 2012 when Weisner decided one day to create a bottle house as well as the spherical object behind it. Weisner wanted to memorialize his 20s and 30s 
When he lived in a, in a geodesic dome in the eastern t Tennessee mountains, that experience was so meaningful to him that he wanted to build this bottle artwork to share with tourists that pay him a visit. By the way, that lighthouse is 15 feet tall and the, the light at top of the lighthouse does light up and spin like a real lighthouse. This is a pretty neat place. Anyway, time to continue to the next stop. If you've watched enough of my videos, I try to find places with very unusual names and I found a place with, here with an unusual name. Welcome to Sop Choppy. Yep, Sop Choppy. It's definitely a unique name. I've reached the city of Sop Choppy. And over here, I'm standing at the Sop Choppy Congregational Holiness Church. Well, the sign is right there, but the church is actually about two blocks on the left. I drove down that little road and I found this interesting building. This is the historic Sop Choppy Gymnasium. It's similar then similar in architecture to the Alamo. The edifice was built in 1939 and was constructed with limestone rock. Across the street is the old Soft Choppy High School. Take a look at the marker. The school was constructed in 1924 and as part of the New Deal in the 1930s, they added onto the school using that same limestone rock used in the gymnasium. It's also mentioned the limestone was mined about 12 miles north of here. Much of the state of Florida is sitting on a on bedrock made of limestone. Oh, and they have the soft choppy opry here. That's a pretty clever name. And by the way, soft choppy is the 67th and final county I have visited. So let's head to this county seat. My final stop of the day is at the Wokala County Courthouse in Crawfordville. I wanted to stand in front of the courthouse for posterity since I've now been to all 67 counties in Florida. Wokala County is fast growing. Its population has more than doubled in the last 30 years. Growing so fast because this, this county is part of metropolitan Tallahassee. I look for State Road 67 to signify all 67 counties, but there's no State Road 67. But I did find State Road 267, close enough I guess. And that's it for my road trip across the coastal panhandle of Florida. Last year I completed all 159 counties in the state of Georgia, and now I've seen all 67 counties in Florida. I've also completed Delaware, but that's a tiny state, so that was easy. I've got more great travels coming soon, but I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching! Bye! And by some miracle, it was cloudy all day but didn't start raining until now, just as the sun was setting. 